coming in yet. If you're on that end, you're going further. Sorry, Brett, I'll leave this guy's left there. Here we go. Right in the center. Here
So a lot of scholars are suggesting that this was added as part of the canon before it was canonized, as it were, because it was a real event. And you recall that they didn't have any of the replay and all those things. So how were stories passed down? They were passed down orally, right? And something like this would have been a very powerful story, and so it would have been passed down orally for quite some time, and it was put into the passage for our benefit. And I believe that the Spirit of God preserved His Word as He chose, and so whether or not John wrote it or not is kind of irrelevant because it does teach biblical truths. In fact, one of the issues that is decided upon to see if a passage in a book is genuinely of God is, is there any contradiction in any other part of the Bible? And there's no other contradictions. In the early church, was this something that was told on a regular basis? It was. And so it was accepted as canonical or as legitimately from God's Holy Spirit. Okay. Also, as we look at this passage, we're kind of going, oh, it's kind of like John said, squirrel, and he got sidetracked. Because this kind of interrupts the flow of what John's writing, doesn't it? But it's here to show us more about the character and the person of Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he came to do, and why he did what he did. Now, i got to ask you, young people, you're probably going to be most of the hands that rise with this one. There's some of us older people that want to raise our hands, but we probably shouldn't. How many of you like different games of tag? Okay. Yeah, there's Pastor Corey and Gerard. I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, I know that young people play all kinds of games of tag, various games of tag, stuff like that. When I was a younger person, uh, we had a game called 23 Escadu. How many of you ever played 23 Escadu? Yeah, my wife and I, and, and uh, yes, that would have been a riot to see that. That would have been fun. Anyway, 23 Escadu is, there's depending upon the size of the group, ours was usually played in a camp, in the most dangerous environment where there were trees uh, and all kinds of other obstacles. And there was usually two or three people who were it. Okay? Now you all know in the game of tag, the person that's it has to tag other people, right? Well, in 23 Eskadu, the object is to tag someone and then you have to escort them back to their prison or their jail. It might have been a particular tree, the sign of a building or something like that. But they had to stay there. The rest of the people are all running around like chickens with their heads cut off, avoiding being tagged because they don't want to have to stand over here in jail, in prison, as it were. <clears throat> so the object is, I'm free, I'm running around, and I see Cameron, he's, he's in jail, he's in prison over there. And so I go, I run over to Cameron, and Renee and Nick are it. And they're trying to tag all these people, but they don't see me. I sneak over to Cameron and I go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I go as fast as I can. Also, Renee hears me. He goes tearing over after me. And I get up to 15. I don't want to be tagged. So I tear off and I leave the area, right? You're still there, but I only got to 16. So Cameron now goes, 16, 16, 16, 16. Okay, Gerard hears that. Nobody's coming after Gerard because they don't want to get steamrolled. So, <laughs> Gerard comes over there. I love you, brother. Okay. Gerard comes over there, and nobody's paying attention to him. And I'm running around, they're all so upset with me, because I got him up to 16. Gerard goes up there, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, Escadu. He's free. Now, he gets to run around, and Renee and Nick are going, we had him in jail, we got to get something, let's go get Gerard. You know, so the game goes on and on and on. Their goal is to get everybody in prison, right? The goal of everybody else, be free. Do you see the parallel? Spiritually speaking, we are to be running around like crazy, doing everything we can with the Holy Spirit's power and strength in us to set people free. To set people free. Get them out of their imprisonment. Get them out of their spiritual jail, as it were. We can do this as we lean upon our Savior, as we learn from Him, as we rejoice in our freedom, and as we live in obedience to Him. So today, my desire is that you and I get the picture in our minds that we would work as hard as we possibly can with God's power helping us 
to free other people from their bondage to sin. So, on the top of your outline, it says there in that little box that we must run with the gospel so as to free others. Okay? So we run with the gospel so as to free others. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. It's all about pointing people to Jesus. So we're going to look, first of all, at the learners under Jesus. Verse 53 starts out, it says, Everyone <clears throat> went to his home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. Now just for us to get a little bit of a time frame here, most scholars suggest that this passage that we're looking at today probably took place during what we call the Passion Week, or the last week of Jesus' life on this planet. Okay? So that gives us a little bit of understanding about the urgency with which Jesus was working here, and also the intensity with which his enemies were working as well. Now, as you look at these first two sentences, anything there impress you? Anything stand out to you? To me, the first thing, yeah, everyone went to his own home. But, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. I find that fascinating. All the everyday people went to their own homes. However, Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. Remember, while on earth, the Bible reminds us that Jesus had no pillow where he put his head. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus wasn't in the real estate market. He owned it. He wasn't looking for his mansion on this planet. He didn't need it. He was busy helping people to understand there is an eternal home in heaven. And without me, you'll never make it there. You can't get there apart from me. Now, it's possible that Jesus stayed with his best friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, because they lived on the east side of this mountain. We don't know. Could be just possibly camped out on the mountain. But regardless, Jesus' concern was not about his own comfort. His concern was about the lost, those who needed a Savior. He was never frustrated that he wasn't put up in a five-star hotel. He didn't get all diva-like and hot and bothered that he wasn't treated like the special person that he really was. He knew who he was. He's the Son of God. He is I am. Then we read that Jesus came into the temple in the morning to teach. And people came to hear what he had to say. Now I look at this and I look at other passages where people came to him. And I see in every single one of them there's not any fanfare. There's no big advertising gimmicks. There was never a thought about him being seeker sensitive. Because the reality is, folks, we don't know what we want. He knows what we need. He knows what we need. We need Him. They need to hear, people need to hear the life-transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The unsaved, especially today, need to hear the message about the Savior who paid the penalty for their sins. The unsaved today need to hear that they can be forgiven and they can be made a brand new person. But what about the saved? What about you and I who know Jesus Christ? Well, today we need to hear what is it God wants of us. What does He want us to be doing? We need to hear the need for us to be obedient. If we say we love Him, then we need to be obedient to His commands. We need to hear how God wants us to become more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ. We need to hear those things. We are to preach Christ and Him crucified. We are to proclaim the fact that we are now new creations in Christ Jesus, and we are now empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in ways that honor and glorify God. Yes. And we need to proclaim a message that is costly, and it does require sacrifice, but cannot be earned by anyone. Then I noticed that he 
sat down and began to teach just like any rabbi would normally do. When a rabbi would sit, that shows their authority. That's not like our culture or Western culture where you stand to be heard or in a classroom sitting where you stand and the students sit because it's much easier to sleep while you're sitting than it is while you're standing, right? So he sat with them. That was a position of authority. He didn't put on airs. He didn't demand respect. We see throughout the Gospels that he spoke with authority. So what do we do? The learners under Christ, we are to present the biblical picture of Jesus. Not the world's picture, not the televangelist's picture, but the biblical picture of Jesus. I don't see anywhere in the Gospels where Jesus attempted to draw a crowd by doing pony tricks. He simply taught God's Word. He did the miraculous not to draw attention, but to minister as the Father had called him to minister, and the result was crowds came to hear what he had to say. Because they knew that a normal person, a son of a carpenter, would not do or could not do all that Jesus could do. No one else, not even the Pharisees, could speak with the authority and power that Jesus had spoken with. Everything Jesus did was so that men and women, boys and girls, would see their need for a Savior. So that they could experience eternal life now and forevermore. So you and I need to understand, we don't have to run around with horns blaring, whistles making all kinds of noise, and bells clanging. We simply need to run with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that others might be set free. However, Act 2, it's not going to be a peaceful day with Jesus teaching. Because now we're going to get an interruption from that pious, self-righteous group of religious leaders. So we look at verses 3 through 8. Leaders against Jesus. Verse 3 starts out, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now, in the law of Moses, God commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? Well, they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, as we look at this, we're introduced to a brand new group of people that are alongside the Pharisees. They are the scribes. The scribes are very much like lawyers at that time. They interpreted the law. They, in fact, they even acted like they had special insight. Most of them were Pharisees, by the way. But these guys acted as if they had special insight. They had special ways of interpreting the law so as to how to apply it to you. Isn't that cool? Never mind me. We're going to get this so it applies to you just the way we want it to. Okay? Now, we already know the antagonism and the animosity that they had towards Jesus. So, it really shouldn't surprise us. You know, that, what was it? Um, the three, three daughters with the dad and the uncle and the friend that were raised. And the little girl, after something happened, she goes, how woo. Okay, that's what these guys were. How woo. They just walked in, in the middle of his instruction, dragging this woman into the middle of the court there, which, by the way, probably was the court of the women, because they would never have brought that woman into any other court other than the court of the women. And they got to be right, you know. Sarcasm intended, okay? You got that? So they, they, they do this hoping to confuse Jesus, okay? They're hoping to really mess with his mind. And in fact, if we can, in front of all of his learners, show him to be a con and show him to be against God, we've got him. See, they were really upset because the people were starting to follow Jesus and not, not them. They were losing their control 
over the people because the people were starting to think for themselves. They were seeing Jesus doing things that only God could do. They were hearing things Jesus was saying that began to make a whole lot more sense because he spoke with the authority of God. He spoke empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, you and I might recall that the law required that if someone is caught in adultery, they're to be put to death, right? So obviously, these guys are accurate. They are correct in their interpretation from a legal perspective. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist. Uh, I'm not a... Well, I am a psychologist a little bit, but that don't hold that against me. I, I'm not, I'm not a, a baby doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. But last time I knew, adultery, as they're describing it, takes two people, right? Are you seeing something wrong with this picture? Oh, Rabbi, um, this woman, she was caught in adultery in the very act. Get a little hormone in your mind if you want to make it even more so. Where's the man? Where is the man at? Because the law actually required that both of them be put to death. Any participant in adultery was to be oh, whoops. Where did they catch this? In the act. Shame on those Pharisees. They didn't bother to protect the woman. They didn't bother to drag the man away and haul him in also. They watched and observed. They should have been stoned. They were participants as well. But see, they weren't there to follow the law, were they? They were there to make a point. In fact, it says... They were testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. Now I was thinking, okay, what would you and I do if we were presented with this situation? Okay, we, we go into the law. We didn't come here to abolish or destroy the law, right? Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. So, all right, what would we do? Well, some of you would probably say, well, let her go. Let her go. There's no guy there. Let her go. Others of you might say, well, the guy got away, but she didn't. So we got we to gotta follow through. But folks, if that happens, who's going to believe that Jesus is compassionate for sinners? Who's going to believe that Jesus is willing to forgive any and all sin? Remember those bracelets? WWJD? Well, what would Jesus do indeed? Well, let's look at this. He didn't respond either way, did he? He didn't respond either way. This onlooking crowd of learners and leaders, what happens? He gets down and he writes on the ground. Just in the dirt there. Just writing on the ground. But the Bible says they persisted. They were getting antsy. He was avoiding their question. Well, so he got up. He said, okay. Whoever here has no sin in their life, let him be the first to cast the first stone. Then he stooped down. Wrote on the ground again. That's all he said. No great oration. No phenomenal legal defense is taught in the law schools today. He just said, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone in her. Now I look at this and I see there's several things that Jesus did not do. Jesus didn't say that the woman was innocent, did he? She may very well have been guilty. He didn't make a commitment to say, you're wrong, she's innocent. He didn't say, you're right, she's guilty. 
But what we can infer from the following verses, Jesus certainly knew her heart, didn't he? Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus also didn't call a mistrial. Guys, look, you've only got the woman. Where's the man? He didn't call a mistrial because only one of them was present. He also didn't call for the Pharisees to be stoned as well, did he? I kind of really like that one. He didn't do that. Instead, Jesus upheld the law and he subtly reminded them, as her accusers, if indeed they were innocent, according to the Torah, their responsibility was to throw the first stone. Nobody else could come along and say, hey, I'll do it. They had to do it. The first stones had to be thrown by the accuser. In fact, Jesus never minimized the law at any point. Those who were there should have understood that Jesus came to fulfill the law. How? To offer himself as a necessary sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, including the scribes and Pharisees. I see here a marvelous example of God's grace, God's mercy, and his total mastery of the situation. Nothing causes Jesus to ever say, oops. That's the original Greek, by the way. <laughs> Folks, there's no need for any of us to act high and mighty, is there? Because every single one of us here, whether saved or unsaved, knows who we are. We can lie to our face in the mirror and say, hey, I'm not so bad. Yes, you are. I am. Even as a saved individual, Paul wrestled with doing the things he ought not to and not doing the things that he wanted to do or should do. But he gives glory to God. Thanks be to God. For his indescribable gift in Christ Jesus. There's none of us here without sin. At the same time, don't swing the pendulum to the opposite side and ignore sin. To offer compromise. I was reminded of this just the other day. But as much as I'd like to walk away from the situation and say I can't deal with that, I've got to. Because the scripture says it must be dealt with. And so, we have to go in the power of Christ. And in the fullness of His love. Not in a condemning, arrogant, haughty, I'm better than you way. But in a way that says, I understand what it means to be forgiven much. How can I help you? to get to that same point. We run in such a way with the gospel that others might be set free. Well, let's move on and see what took place as a result of this bizarre situation which the Pharisees and scribes thought that they would have the upper hand. Verses 9 through 11, we see that she was liberated by Jesus. And the majority of us here have been liberated by Jesus. When they had heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one will. And Jesus said, I do not continue either. Go. Sin no more. From now on, sin no more. After hearing Jesus' challenge, after seeing whatever it was he was writing on the ground, the accusers left. And again, I, I 
Yes, I, I have squirrel moments when I'm studying these things. So here's a squirrel moment. Okay? They left one by one. The oldest left first. Scratching my head saying, why is this put down here? Why didn't you just say, and they all left? Well, I'm guessing that age brings a little wisdom. Age looks back and knows the boatload of sin that we have in our lives, right? <coughs> one by one, I'm guessing what Jesus said hit pretty hard. Because for this woman to be stoned, one of them had to declare themselves innocent, free of sin. Cast that person. <coughs> Not one person is able to do it. Oh, but who could have done it? Jesus could have done it. But he says, I hope he did. Remember what Paul says? Who is he that condemns Christ Jesus? It is he. The only one who has the power to condemn is Jesus Christ. And that is for only those who reject his offer of salvation. The reality is, the Bible is silent as to what caused them to leave this way. But the reality is, they left. But the sad part of the fact that they left is that if they would have humbled themselves and confessed their own sin, they could have experienced their peace. They walked away. But folks, what they didn't experience, this woman was about to experience. Jesus and the woman are alone in the middle of the court. Jesus comes up from the ground where he was writing, and he asks a very obvious question. Where did they go? Where are your accusers? Has no one been left? Squirrel. Nobody has talked directly to the woman until Jesus spoke. Did you notice that? She was the one who was about to be killed because of the self-righteous smugness and they hadn't bothered to engage her in any conversation at all. They were there solely for the purpose of destroying Jesus. And the law required a trial. But Jesus spoke directly to her. The world may condemn you, my friend. Jesus speaks directly to you. I do not condemn you, but you have to agree that there's sin in your life. You have to come to the point where you confess before Him your sin. If you and I just keep going our merry way and say, hey, I don't need Him, you are condemned. But if you and I say, I need your help. I need to be forgiven. I need to be a brand new person. Jesus says to you, I do not condemn you. But don't just stop. He says, go. From now on, sin no more. Folks, we have half a gospel if we just say, ask Jesus into your life and everything's going to be hunky-dory. No. If Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you're going to live differently, folks. You're not going to, going to want to live the way you used to live. You want to let the world know, I belong to God. I am a child of the King, and you think I'm good now? I'm, I like how Ron, you ask Ron, or he asks you how you're doing, and you say good, you're in trouble. <laughs> because Ron's going to say to you, only God is good. And brother, you are right. So if you want to get around it, just say, I'm doing well. <laughs> and God is good. And then walk along with a high five. Him. Because that's the reality. Only God is good. 
We're not held accountable for our past sins if we've experienced forgiveness, are we? I love what Gerald Borchardt says in his commentary on this. He says, quote, Jesus' verdict, neither do I condemn you, was not rendered as a simple acquittal or a non-condemnation. The verdict was, in fact, a strict charge for her to live from this point on very differently, to sin no more. The liberating work of Jesus did not mean the excusing of sin. Encountering Jesus always has demanded the transformation of life, the turning away from sin. It was not treated lightly by Jesus, but sinners were offered the opportunity to start life anew. Amen to that. There is no excuse, no wiping away. Oh, it's all okay. No, it's not all okay. If it's okay, you're going to get to heaven without that. It's not okay. Sin is never acceptable. And for the child of God, be like Joseph. Run far away from sin. Have nothing to do with it. But what if I do sin? Yeah, welcome to humanity. We do sin, but it's not because we want to. It's because we stupidly don't submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and allow His Holy Spirit to have absolute control over us. It's because I said, I got this one, God. Guess what? Satan's got you. Not permanently, but he's going to use you. One of the earlier passages that I committed to memory after I became a Christian is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I, I had to write it down because I've memorized so many different translations. It's going to come out like a Heinz 57. Okay, but catch the gist of this. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? May it never be. No way should this be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, folks, memorize that just like I spoke it. Because it's absurd to think that I died to sin, but I can still play in sin. You can't. Shall we go on sinning so the grace can increase? Paul says, are you nuts? By no means. May it never be. The strongest, most emphatic Greek negative you can find in all the New Testament. Brother and sister in Jesus Christ, get off this kick of I'm saved, but I can live like I want. No, if you're saved, you live like Jesus wants. Not like I want. And the reality is, if you're saved, you're going to want to live the way Jesus wants you to. Anything else comes from the evil. So what's the dirt? One of the truths which I believe that we can glean from this passage today is to be practiced in our everyday lives is just simply this. There's a couple things here, but one I want to jump out with is you and I can be merciful without compromising. We can be merciful without compromising moral and biblical principles. We need to be reminded that mercy and justice are not opposed to each other. They walk hand in hand. And that's most clearly seen when we think about God extending His mercy to us through Jesus Christ while He extended His justice on sin through Jesus Christ. Without justice, we would not know what mercy is. Another thing that we need to be reminded of is what Orchard describes as our response when we're forgiven. Encountering Jesus always has demanded the transformation of life, the turning away from sin. In other words, when you and I encounter Jesus Christ and have Him as our Lord and Savior, we pursue the things of God. We no longer pursue the things of the world, the attitudes, the minds, and the behaviors of this world. Folks, I don't want to be like those leaders that we read about earlier, the scribes and Pharisees. You shouldn't either. Don't just say you're following God but then have your own little rules and regulations. You know, it's really easy to create those lists. I, I can have a list. In fact, I used to have one. Amongst our circles, the joke amongst the women, men like women, was, 
We don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't dance, and we don't date those who do. It's a nice neat little list, isn't it? Kind of a stupid list. Because we've actually got rhythm. Not <laughs> much. Anyway. We, we can come up with our own little rules list because if I create it, I'm going to be able to do it, right? You think I'm going to come up with a list that I've got problems with? No way. I just condemn myself. But if I can come up with a list where if you're going to make a debit, you have to be just like me. That's scary by itself, isn't it? Where's grace and mercy? There is none. So don't, don't buy into that camp. There's a lot of churches around the world <coughs> that practice this. If you don't use this translation of the Bible, you're probably not going to heaven. Girls, you wear jeans, slacks, and skirt. Questionable. Not really. But there are churches that talk about that. If you sing this wild stuff that we're about to sing. <laughs> by the way, Cameron, did you get that YouTube thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wish we could show that. Anyway, squirrel, right? We want to be those who have. Well, you bring us to do. We have been set free from sin. And we run around and we look for those others. Maybe it's relatives, maybe it's neighbors, maybe it's friends, maybe it's co-workers, and we see them. And they're captured. They're in that prison. And we run up to them and we go, one, two, three, four, but not really. You're sharing the love of Jesus Christ with them is what you're doing. And you don't know how long you have with that person, but you plant as many seeds as you possibly can. And when they chase you out, someone else is going to come along. And they're going to plant those seeds. 15, 16, 17, 18. And then there's one day that the Holy Spirit is going to get a hold and say, 21 Eskadoo! I set you free. But only Jesus can do that. But you and I plant the seeds, don't we? We plant the seeds. We make ourselves available for those who need to learn of Jesus. And folks, every single one of us who is born again, until the moment God calls us home, we are learning so regardless of where the dirt may be, what the dirt may be, or who is in the dirt, you and I need to run with the gospel so as to set other people free. Let's pray together. Stand if you will. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word gives us hope. That your word shows us Jesus above all else. And we thank you, Father, that we can experience salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Help us to be a people who will run like crazy to proclaim Jesus to a lost and dying world. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. So, who here has been liberated by Jesus? Anybody? Yeah. Hallelujah. Time to worship. Worship this song now. We just... Thank you, Pastor. What a great message. Thank you, Father, for the word that you preserved throughout all these years. And uh, let's lift voices to our God and King, shall we?
Lord, shall we please? We stand and place that you've given us to come and worship you. Thank you for giving us these, this opportunity to do so. And Father, as we, as we receive, our, receive the tithes and offering now, Father, we pray that you would bless them, that you would multiply that, that you would make that, so that we can continue the work here and outside of these walls, Father. And we do this in Jesus' name. Now, if you would turn to the person next to you and tell them that Jesus is the Messiah.
Hallelujah. We want to see. We want to see. We want to see Jesus.
good. All right, listen. We're gonna do a little uh, little thing here. We got. Yeah, that's our older folks have been on for us. We're gonna have them go this way. There's a set of stairs go around back. This way, you got uh, plenty of time to get down there. We're gonna honor you. You guys can serve first, and uh, the rest of us all up here will sing one more song, then we'll go down. Uh, but before we do that, let's, let's take a moment and thank God for everything. Father God, thank you for thank you for the food we're about to eat. Thank you for making that all possible, that we can come together, family and friends, and just enjoy the life that you've given us. And we praise you, Father, for this forever, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Let's eat.